years now that are on there. Brian, your turn. Hey, Ashlyn. My turn? Your turn. Yeah, so this is my wife, Ashlyn, uh, and we're expecting a baby in a month. <laughs> Still that in there because everyone gets excited about it. Um, and uh, I'm going backwards. So then I got married in February and <laughs> no, that'd be too difficult. But um, so I started following Jesus in 2016, uh, July of 2016. I um, did not grow up really in the faith at all. Uh, and I, I was really convicted just through the Holy Spirit. Um, and from the first day that I was led by the Holy Spirit to gather a bunch of my friends together to read the Bible, I committed my life that day to read, do, and share the Bible. And uh, I did that for 10, 10 months into my senior year of college and then graduated and tried to find someone to disciple me. Neil was the only one that would. So I was, I was the only one. <laughs> and so Neil, Neil started to disciple me in May of 2017. And he really helped um, really come alongside of what the Holy Spirit was already doing in my life. And, and helped me get the words um, and, and the simple instruction to be able to like teach others also. Um, Cause it was just baking, it was, I was making a bunch of noise, but like it wasn't going outside of just the people right around me. And so, yeah, that's, I've been making disciples ever since. It's been a joy and a light burden and an easy yoke. Amen. Yeah. Ashlyn, your turn. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I would say I grew up in like a religious home or a Christian home, but I wouldn't say um, a God-fearing home. And there was a lot of just inconsistencies growing up where I, I had like like some experiences with the Lord, but then there was some disobedience around me and just broken family. And, and so I there were seasons of like trying to seek him, but it was just like this roller coaster. And I was just always kind of told that that's just how spiritual life is. Like, it's just a roller coaster. It's a ride. And, and then I went off to college and I really strayed um, and without going into detail, just like was really pursuing the passions of my flesh in this world. And um, had been hurt in some ways and was just like totally trying to like prove myself in um, yeah just like prove myself and it, it just was a failure and ultimately by the end of all of that I was in a really weak weak space before the Lord and cried out to him and and he showed me grace and and it was the first time in my life that I hadn't just heard about God's grace but I actually was truly experiencing his grace and he just filled me with a fear of him and I was baptized shortly after that that was my sophomore year of college so um it was actually the same year that Ryan came to faith 2016 about four years ago but we didn't know each other at the time <laughs> um and then really from there he's just given me a hunger and a thirst for his word he stirred my heart towards obedience to his word and cultivated in me just this desire of like even if everyone else around me is going to be disobedient like I have I have to be obedient to to Jesus like I don't want to live any other way and um was trained by Ryan in some simple teachings just how to make disciples who make disciples um about a year and a half after I came to the Lord and it was just like, it was such a blessing to actually at that point have like tangible steps and from there have just been growing and, and yeah, there are like low points, but I would not identify like walking with the Lord as like a roller coaster or like unpredictable. Like he is so steadfast and, um, and unwavering. And, and so I'm just like really grateful to have yeah, to like have a new heart that actually wants to love him and obey him. Amen. Guys, thanks so much um, for sharing that, just sharing the introduction and for taking time to 
meet with us. And I think what I'm grateful for is to, you know, as just we're hearing some of your story, which I know is just such a small snapshot of who you are, but um, to feel that that connection because of following Jesus and having that common mission and that common purpose uh, is amazing. So, um, so yeah, thankful for your hearts and thankful for just that, just even you're introducing yourself in that way. I can already feel like uh, connected to you guys. So um, I think uh, what I'm excited about in connecting with you guys now tonight is just the reality that so much of the way that movements and the, the kingdom grows is as we we have these hot coals that go from place to place and we begin to just um, catch on fire from one another. So um, we would love to just hear more from you guys of what that story's looked like. And Neil, Ryan, you guys, however you want to frame that, whether that's from 2016 to now, um, but just sharing some of the highlights. I don't know if you want to wait for Jeremy. I know Jeremy said he's going to jump on a little bit late. Um, however, uh, if you guys want to wait for that, that's okay too, but, um, really giving you guys just whatever space you want. But I think, um, just you being feeling free to share your story and, uh, those highlights, I think will be really encouraging to us. So thank you so much for joining and however you want to share that. We'd love to make space for that. Excellent. Um, I can start and then Ryan, I'll, uh, hand it off to you in, in just a little bit. Um, so the, I, I guess, medium-sized version of my story in that is met Jesus as well when I was in college. Um, and I had grown up in the faith, all that's, well, grown up in the church, I should say, but did not know Jesus, um, was trying to be a, just a really moral person. And when I was in college, it was actually the first time where God showed me the way to my sin. And for the first time in my life, I realized I actually deserve hell. Um, and then partnered with that, he showed me what he actually did for me on the cross. And it, it rocked me. It was the first time that then I was not trying to stand on my own good works, but was actually trusting in him. Um, and then just a little bit after that, I ran into a, a guy who's now actually in my house church. At the time, we were more just kind of acquaintances, but he had heard that the Lord was doing something in my heart. And he came alongside me and he's like, hey, have, have you ever been filled with the Holy Spirit? And um, the, the church that I grew up in was, we talked a lot about the Father, Son, and the Holy Scriptures, but never talked really about the Holy Spirit. And um, so he showed me a couple of passages from the book of Acts. Immediately, I was just like, yep, I want that. Um, and so uh, he called up a couple of friends, and they came and laid hands on me and prayed over me. And um, I had... The, the, yeah, I had never heard anybody pray in tongues or anything like that before. And they're laying hands on me and I just go quiet for a little bit. I start praying and it comes out in a different language and I knew exactly what I was praying. So I was able to interpret it. And um, all these things happen in a short amount of time. And then um, I, I did basically what anybody who's really passionate about Jesus does. You either need to go become a missionary or become a pastor. Um, that's that was your only two options. Um, and so I went to become a pastor and so I went to seminary. Um, and in that did an intern with internship with a church. Um, when I got done with seminary, I was like, I don't know if I want to go in and do this. Um, so I went and worked in a secular job for a few years, but then the church called me back and said, Hey, we'd like you to become a pastor. So I became a pastor I was doing that for like five years and that's when me and one of my best friends got together and the language we were using at the time was we know how to keep these machines running, but are we actually making disciples? Um, and so that's what sent us on this journey of really like trying to, trying to figure out how do we do this? And so um, we started just by opening up my living room and inviting a few people over and said, hey, let's try this thing called house church. And so um, opened up the living room and did that for a few weeks. But then we were kind of like, okay, let's keep trying this. So people started inviting more people. And then we accidentally started what we now call a mega house church. Yep, mega house church. Those were the days. 
And so we had like 60 people in our living room and, um, and the Lord would show up and do really cool things. But quite frankly, nobody was really going out and making disciples still. Um, so it was then that we got introduced to some people who, for the first time, I heard about movement stuff. I heard about movement happening in Pakistan, Afghanistan. I heard about disciples making disciples. And when I heard some of the testimonies, I was just like, I am swimming in the kiddie pool of ministry. Um, I got invited to go to a training at that point. So I went to an Auburn um, and got trained. And I remember driving home, just feeling like I cannot unlearn what I just learned. And so I'm still a pastor. We're doing mega house church in our living room. I just got trained much more intentionally with how to make disciples And me and my wife just start praying and we're asking God, God, do you want us to go and do this other stuff? We don't even know what that means, what that would look like, how we would pay the bills. Um, or do you want us to keep being a pastor? So we're praying that. And I'm, um, I'm in my bedroom preparing for an elder and deacons meeting at the church. And my daughter was two and a half at the time. And she just comes up next to the chair that I'm sitting in. And she just says, daddy, you're sewing on the path. Um, in two and a half year olds, they, that's, that's not normal language for a two and a half year old. Um, but I heard her crystal clear and I, I just looked at her and I said, honey, what did you say? And she goes, you're sewing on the path. And I said, honey, did you say you're sewing on the path? And she goes, yeah, the birds are your friends. And I'm like, oh, dang. Um, so I scooped her up and took her down to my, down to my wife and I said, honey, say, say to mommy what you said to daddy. And she said the exact same thing. And my wife just looks at me and goes, did she say it to you that clear upstairs? And I was like, yeah. And that was the moment we knew that we were done at the church that we were at. Um, and so then I, I told the other pastor at the church, we told the uh, elders, they said, hey, let's keep it quiet for a little bit until we figure out what we're going to do um, when you step away. And the Sunday came where we were going to tell the church. And so that morning, the other pastor preached in after he preached, he asked the church, um, did the Lord lay anything on anybody's heart? And we were not like a charismatic church at all. We were a 110 year old church, um, reformed Calvinistic church out in the middle of blueberry fields. And, um, and this woman raises her hand. And so I go bring her the microphone. And right after this, me and my wife are going up front to tell the church, hey, the Lord's called us into something new. And so I hand her the microphone and she says, um, last night, the Lord gave me a dream. And while I was sitting here, he told me to share a part of it. And she says, there was in the dream, there was a group of people cutting their way through a jungle. And they came to this cave. And then they took the torch and they lit a torch of one person who then went through the cave and was lighting other torches as he went. And she says, I, I believe somebody from this church is supposed to go and do something new. Um, and I'm just staring at my wife because literally I take the microphone from her. I go grab my wife's hand and we go up to the front and we just say, Hey, the Lord's called us into something new. And uh, so we tell the church that, and then the woman actually came up to us. Um, hey, Jeremy's here. Anyways, um, Jeremy, are you there, brother? I am. One second. Okay, no problem. I'm just sharing a story that you've heard too many times already anyways. So, um, so then after, after the, the service, the woman came up to me and my wife and basically said, Neil, in all honesty, it was, it was you in the dream. I just didn't dare, dare to tell the church that our pastor is supposed to go and do something different. <laughs> um, and so that's how then we ended up actually joining up with a ministry called uh, Big Life and started just really opening up our home um, started working with, with others in the area and got to see a lot of groups started really quickly. Um, but as we were doing a lot of that work with a bunch of groups and all this stuff, 
as it continued to progress, a lot of that stuff was linked to another church. And um, as it progressed, it kept getting more and more confusing, especially for that other church. And so eventually they had to really take a step back. And that left us with kind of like this band of, of people, um, even those on the call here, who we really then just got to run together and really try to try to learn together, spur one another on in, in love and good deeds. And so that's where from that point, we got to see stuff happen really wide, but nothing actually go like really deep in terms of generational growth. But actually it was when a lot of that stuff got taken away that we were left with just the few. And then it was from those few that then we actually, by the grace of God, got to see some generational growth start to happen. Um, and so a lot of that generational growth has honestly probably been in the last three ish years, right around there. Or so, and that's where honestly, these people on the call, Jeremy, Ryan, Ashlyn have really been at the forefront of getting to, to do that work, to see that work, um, to be disciples themselves who'd go out and, and make disciples. So there's a, a brief snapshot of that so far, Ryan, your turn. Thanks. It's good to see your face, Jeremy. Yeah, Jeremy. <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm Jeremy. Good to see you guys. I, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll share and it, I'll, I'll feed it right into a softball pitch for Jeremy. Um, but I, so um, I think if I, I do this correctly, seven years ago was Mega House Church. Is that correct, Neil? Yeah, well, that wasn't quite, that was when we started just with a small group in our living room. And then from there, soon after that came Mega House Church. Okay. So like seven years ago, again, so I'm not even like following Jesus at that point. And, and so like come my point of repentance and then following Christ, I, in my coming to Christ, I was very unbi like biblically illiterate as they come. Like as like getting teased by Christians because I didn't know what the abbreviation of Matthew was kind of thing. And um, so I, I was biblically illiterate and, but I knew in the depths of my soul that I was supposed to read the Bible. I was supposed to do what it says and I'm supposed to share it with all of everybody in my life. And I was just doing that. I was like, like a big storm like a couple months of me so convicted that there were so many people like myself who don't know that the Bible is true. Um, and no one's sharing it with anybody because I was the guy that was in the dorm room, uh, supplying alcohol to the floor and having a bar in my room. And then the, the front row chapel people in the chapel band were on the same floor in the hall with me and they just like wouldn't associate with me uh and no one ever shared with me like the whole three and a half you know, the whole four years of my college career at a christian school no one shared the gospel with me okay and so when i came to know like the truth in the word i was like there are so many of me's out there that i was like i need to go and share and and so I began to do that and the weirdest thing happened. Okay. When I started to read, do and share the Bible, I started to lose my friends, but then not fit in with the Christians. And I was like, what is going on? Like, this is so weird. And, um, because they were having like, like parties, like Christian parties. And it was, um, they would, they would play board, they would play board games and have, they would carry like a six pack and drink maybe one or two beers but like I would play drinking games and carry in a 30 rack and drink like nine to 12 beers. And I was like, this is like the same thing, just like a lesser crappier version of what I was doing. If this is the Christian life, man, I am like, I'm running the other direction. And cause like, it's not what I, I was reading in the book of acts. Um, and so it's, it started stirring up a bunch of stuff. And I, I, I was like trying to start this movement and I was doing a lot of event-based ministry stuff um, at my school within Greek life, like fraternities and sororities. 
and then I graduated and I was trying to um, work with the school to make a position for myself so I could be like the chaplain of Greek life so I could like continue to evangelize this this people group and it was just like just not working out and they it was like this weird tension with the school but I was like well you can't keep me from sitting in the coffee shop like right next to the school so I just kept evangelizing for like the next year um to the students um and so I in that time like Neil what he did was um I was always burdened okay Matthew and like Jesus shares he's like my burden is light my yoke is easy I talked to pastors and all these ministry leaders and they're burning out and um, they're burdened as all get out. And I'm like, that's not Jesus's burden. Like, like in, in, if you read in that, that passage, it says, Jesus says right before that, he's like, come and learn from me. And I just realized that like, we just weren't learning from Jesus in the way that he ministered the gospel. And so I began to then through Neil's instruction, began to follow him as he follows Christ. And he's like, we're gonna make disciples. And cause I was, I was like picking grass. And I was meeting with like a hundred people in three months kind of pace of picking grass. And I was like a big field and I was overwhelmed, but then I started making disciples. And what happened was, um, I was still like meeting with a lot of people, but I was just like, I was like sifting through a lot of them and came like through my first couple of years came just like a couple sprouts of what we call fat disciples or like faithful, available and teachable disciples. And Ashlyn was one of them. This girl named Hannah was one of them. And then it was like, that was the first year, hundreds of people met with, there was two people that came out of that first year. And, and then it was like, boom, like we're still ministering the gospel, evangelizing, making disciples, doing trainings, all this stuff. And we're like, as we're going, it's, it feels like we're building the plane. Um, but like, it's flying. It's, it's, it's fine, but, um, we were just like learning as we go. And, and then I met Jeremy, uh, and then we started becoming running mates, which is like, was the most encouraging and edifying thing in my life. Um, outside of meeting Neil, um, was actually, you know, have a brother to do day in day out life with because Neil had a family and stuff. So, um, I was spending a lot of time with Neil, but like Jeremy and I were able to live together and labor together and go to Europe and travel together and make disciples together. And, and, um, that the scripture, when it says one can chase down a thousand and two, 10,000, it is very accurate. Um, and so Jeremy was, was that guy, uh, for me and me to him. And, um, yeah, we came back from Europe and moved to Grand Rapids and just started to pray and fast over the, and whip, whip out a map of Grand Rapids, start praying over it, praying for laborers. Uh, to be sent out into the harvest fields. And we just went out and tried to find them, uh, finding these people of peace. And um, we found this one pe person of peace. Her name's Ashley. And I'm going to just toss it over to Jeremy. Thank you. Um, so we're just kind of sharing the story of West Michigan movement kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and I mean, you can share about your story a little bit too and how that like intertwines. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks for having me. Um, my wife will probably be hopping in the car um, maybe in 15 minutes or so. We're actually um, at some people's house right now modeling uh, a three-thirds that just started. So it's the second week that we've been helping them gather. And um, so I just kind of snuck out uh, towards the end. So, but yeah, I, I came into the Lord um, about seven years ago, um, I was born and raised in Grand Rapids and uh, baptized as a baby, um, grew up going to church twice on Sundays sort of thing. And um, so I, I, I kind of grew up around it, but um, just didn't really know the power of faith, didn't know the, um, yeah, just didn't know Christ. So I came to know Jesus uh, my senior year of high school. Um, and the Lord just saved me and, um, started to walk with him and just love him and fall in love with him and wanted to share that with others. Um, and then a year later, I met a year and a half later, I met Neil. Um, so I got invited to, uh, house church 
and so I, I had no idea what that was. It was it was mega house church at the time. Yeah, um, and it, it's so funny to you know in some ways it was kind of fun like looking back at it. Uh, there's something about it that you know there's always new people there, and it was like you know we were praying for people and saw some kind of crazy stuff, but um, it 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 really wasn't like multiplying all oh, my lights are out here one moment all right <laughs> um yeah and so um so i had i had been walking with neil and and started some stuff in grand rapids and um i started a house church and so um can you guys hear me still? Yeah. It just transferred. Okay. It sounds like it just transferred to your car. So instead of it being through your phone directly, it sounds like we're getting it to your car right now. So we can okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Um, and I did that for a year. And that was before I'd met Ryan. Um, and I was in college at the time and, um, had gone overseas to YWAM and was just kind of, kind of just uh, drifting in different arenas and stuff. And just, I love God. I had passion for him, wanting to do his will, but just didn't have clarity of what that looked like day in and day out. Um, so did that with my parents and it was kind of, it was a frustrating year a little bit looking back, um, because it was just a hodgepodge of people, um, that were gathering and you know i was just burdened of obedience the last third um that we need to uh, to obey this and to share this and every time i bring it up it was just cricket and um it was just awkward and i think uh a very valuable lesson i learned from that that um i'll probably bookmark or just highlight and talk about later is in the whole journey of that was a crucial step for me in my journey as i realized the importance of making disciples because I was gathering people together and almost trying to disciple them in like kind of like a group, but it wasn't like intentional. It was kind of like wanting them to bring them in, like join this group and then go do this. But I wasn't really walking with them, modeling it, holding them personally accountable and, and really pouring deeply into people that actually wanted to be um, disciples, making disciples. Um, so, and I got really frustrated and burdened and burnt out by that. So ended up kind of stepping away from that, gathered with Neil for a while. Um, and the, it was like 10 kids at the time, um, under five. And, uh, that was, that was a hoot. And it was like three families with all kids and then me. Um, and, um, so, and then around that time I met Ryan um, and we did sort of this like informal, uh, internship in Holland, um, with Neil and this other guy named Britton, who was a, a pastor of an institutional church out there that was trying to decentralize. So there's about 10 of us who, um, just kind of were devoted for a summer, um, that every day we just go out into the streets, meet people, pray for people, share the gospel. Uh, teach them to gather and go and do the same and it was just like intensive it was like here's training but then just go um, and so that was just really transformational for me um, of that's when I really saw the the, the process of, of generational discipleship and so I could understand um, discipling somebody and I could even somewhat understand teaching somebody to disciple someone, but I, I did not yet see like teaching someone to teach someone to teach someone to teach someone and on and on and on. And like the importance of the simplicity of what we're doing is trying to see this passed on. Um, so something just happened in me that summer of like, I'm done drifting around doing a little bit here, a little bit there. Like, I, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life is make disciples who make disciples. And I uh, was just so settled in that. Um, so that, that summer, me and Ryan lived together. And like he said, we started to run together. And I'm going to fast forward over um, a little bit. But then we were in Grand Rapids 
together, uh, like Brian said, and met Ashley at this prayer group. And Ashley was just a, a person of peace. Um, she had maybe known two people in Grand Rapids, and she had moved there um, about a half a year before we met her. She moved there from Texas, Houston, Texas, and uh, the, the Lord just told her to move to Grand Rapids. Um, and the Lord told her to buy a house and that it would be used, um, in a sense to reach out to the neighborhood, but she had no idea what that, what that meant, what that looked like. And it's just kind of amazing to, to think about it, that she just happened, you know, because all along, a lot of our prayers were Lord raise up labors, raise up labors every day. We were praying that, um, and that, that prayer has been answered, um, a hundredfold. And that was another two people that Ashley was friends with, Jacob and Bailey. They had the same thing. They had people speak over them, prophesy over them, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And they were in Arizona. Um, just crazy. Um, and some other people as well. And so, uh, and they were just kind of coming out of, uh, they were all like youth leaders at this Lutheran church. And it kind of imploded and like, it was just some drama that was really um, just not good and just kind of uh, pitted, made them um, the bad guys in the situation. And it was just, it was just not handled well. So they were kind of hurt from that whole situation of like, what do we do now? So it was just perfect timing that we met her in that, in that place of, of trying to understand truly what is church. Um, and so for a while she was just processing it with us and then, she became almost like a Lydia um, to, to Paul in Philippi, in a sense, in the book of Acts, when she's just like, come to my, stay at my house. And she just opened up uh, a lot. And um, from her house, she was the only person that really owned, owned a house that could be really fully dedicated to the mission and to the church. And so it was like day in and day out, we were at that house praying, training, encouraging discipling just everything was just kind of going out from there in the neighborhood and other places and um and then a few months later we met this guy named taylor who i had known um a little bit uh, years past but i uh, just randomly met him in a chick-fil-a and he was like the lord's been putting on my heart house churches and, and discipleship and so um and so just random and, and the next day was easter sunday and he's like all right, I, I want to, I want to go and do what you guys are doing just throughout all of his Easter plans. And next morning he's like, I'll be there early so we can talk. Um, it was in like 10 hours, um, after just meeting him, he's like, I'll be there. And so he showed up and he brought even more people and he was just so intrigued and that just like, it changed him to see the organicness of, of just a handful of people, not a ton of people, but just gathering, loving one another um and just getting to share freely and then we just on easter sunday we just all went out in the streets and just reached people um with the gospel thinking that this is probably uh almost a filtered people of these are the people that really we we need to reach who are not in in the church building on on easter sunday um so then he was another huge kind of component in grand rapids he just like really like after that that Sunday, he was like, I'm going to go back to, you know, my institutional church and tell them I'm leaving. And so he kind of did that. And then he just jumped fully into it and started reaching out to other people and um, started discipling people. And um, so things just kind of grew. And at the time, in the beginning, there was also a couple uh, house churches that were already there, um, a little bit through Neil, a little bit through this other church um named crossroads that was kind of doing some house church blend thing and so there's a handful there's almost like nine um but then it sort of went down to like two um and then to one um really like faithful group um and so the, the groups were always just kind of in flux um as the disciples i think were being established and founded um because i think that's something that we learned too in that time is like we would see kind of a group form and then it would kind of you know stumble along and then then it would kind of fall apart and then they would kind of join with another group and you know from the outside it could be really discouraging and like 
wow, there's just no cohesiveness and it looks all jumbled. But in the meantime, Ash was being discipled very deeply. Taylor was being discipled. Others were being poured really deeply into. And what, what I love about that is, is those Ashley and Taylor, I'll just use them. There's more people, but as an example is that if, if their group fell apart tomorrow, they would go and start another one. And if that one fell apart, they would go and start another one. And like, they will not stop. And it's like, you put them in any state, in any country, that's what they're going to do. Um, and that I, I truly believe only happens by like intentional um, life giving discipleship. Um, and, and that's the difference between uh, my, the church that I was a part of with my parents where it just crumbled. And then like that, it was like one week we decided we're not going to do this anymore. And then I basically never saw those people again. And it's just like the fruit is so evident. Um, and so those people who will persist in the messiness of seeing a strong fam spiritual family formed. Um, so um, I, there's probably some stuff I'm leaving out, Ryan, but um, things just began to grow and form more deeply and um, met more people, started discipling more people and um, trying to think what would be helpful. Maybe, maybe we can, I can toss to you, Ryan, you can toss back to me or whatever. Yeah, that's good. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna hot potato it to Ashlyn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we're just sharing as the spirit leads. Like, I really have no idea where you all are at, or you know, if if we're just sitting here preaching to the choir and you all are just being edified or built up, or if this is all just like totally new, or if you're still kind of on on the edge of like even maybe a little bit of like a little skeptical I I don't know but um the Lord really brought re to remembrance for me as I was praying just like sitting here two really big paradigm shifts that took place in my just like mind and heart and everything um and this was really in 2017 so like a year after I came to the Lord and then or no, 2018, it was when I graduated. A year after I came to the Lord, um, many months after I had first um, begun to be equipped to make disciples who make disciples. And up until that point, it was all like really great information. And I was implementing as I saw fit and so forth. But I, like Jeremy, spoke of a point when he was like this is my whole life like this is this is the way that I am to live like no matter where I live or who I'm with or what job I may have or whatever it may be like this is my purpose through and through um and that point really came for me in May of 2018 I had just graduated and you know the world is at my fingertips or whatever. I was, I was about to go work at a camp, um, for a third, like third summer at camp. And that labor training school was happening in Holland that Jeremy mentioned where there was like this, this group of, of people who were really just day by day going to be trained in in evangelism and discipleship and starting groups. And, I was just going off on my own to work another summer at this camp. And I was like, man, Lord, I'm doing this because I told you I was going to do this. And I told this camp I was going to do this, but I would rather be at that labor training school. Um, and right before I went, the first of those two big paradigm shifts took place. And it, it was this shift from thinking that discipleship was for some that discipleship was almost for like the elite few and to be a trainer of trainers, a, like a teacher of teachers and, and whatnot was like a gifting maybe that the Lord was giving some or that would give to someone for like a season of their life versus this is his purpose for all people 
uh, like all of his people at all times, no matter where they are. And that it came through a really interesting verse. I'm not going to read through it, the whole thing um, in Hebrews 6. If you want to go check it, it out, it's the unchangeable um, promise of God's purpose. And it just, my eyes were in, unveiled just like before the Lord praying about this very topic of like, is this really my whole life? Like I grew up in cultural Christianity where it was like, okay to to accept just this like American Christian dream. And I, I was just like really wrestling with that. And he just unveiled to me that like his first command for all people or for his people to Adam and Eve was like, go be fruitful and multiply. And when Noah <laughs> was like, you know, this fresh start of, of again, his first people, God's command to him was to go be fruitful and multiply. And when he called Abraham from his people to make a nation and to make like God's people, God said like your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashores. And his heart was to bless Abraham and his people and to multiply them, like to be fruitful and to multiply. And and then we see that all throughout even Israel, like he sets apart this nation to be his people and to multiply and to be like this city on a hill for all of the world and all nations to see God's glory and that these people were his. And then Jesus's ministry, like the number of parables I could point to where, where Jesus is saying like, essentially take what I'm giving to you and pass it on. And, and with the great commission, he's saying, go be fruitful and multiply. Mm -hmm. And then in revelation, we see the fruition of it when the great multitude comes before God's throne and it will be, it will, it will happen. And it's like, I just felt the Lord saying like, are you, are you going to multiply? Like, are you going to be a part of that? This is my heart. It's not new. It's not some trendy teaching that I am giving <laughs> you and some of your friends. This is not just like something I want you to do while you're, you're young and free or whatever to devote your life to. Like this is his heart and, and it has been from the beginning. And so that was, that was huge for me. And then I went into that summer <laughs> and I was all on my own working at this camp. And I was like, this, this is my life. And, and so I was like teaching things that, you know, just like simple, simple things about discipleship and, and started a group there at that camp and similar to what Jeremy was saying like so much of that just like fell apart but the Lord was fashioning like me as a disciple and a disciple actually worth multiplying and then the other big paradigm shift <laughs> was um at the end of the summer that was like right at the beginning of the summer and then at the end um, it was really low cost to like start a group or a house church, whatever you want to call it at that camp, because we couldn't leave. So <laughs> nobody could go to a church. And for me to invite five women to gather in that way, it was like, well, yeah, we can't do anything else. Um, but then I left camp and I didn't have an option. And it was like, I went and attended a, a church that I had been attending um, previously I went one time and I just sat there and it was, it was all good. I, I like totally respect a lot of the people there. Um, not that I didn't respect others, but those that I knew I really respected, but I just remember sitting there and being like, I don't need this. Like this is not necessary. Um, and the Lord had really freed me from some of the things I thought maybe were necessary. But the deeper paradigm shift that I'm talking about was not um, to gather in homes or to gather in a large building. Um, it was this re revelation um, that was really shared with me probably like too many times to count prior to me actually like receiving it in my heart. Um, and that was that we cannot go to church. Um, 
because church is not a place and it's not a time of the week. Um, it's not a program. Like we are his church. And in the same way that like he called people to be the ones to go be fruitful and multiply, like he has called his church to be fruitful and multiply, but that's not buildings. That That is us. And, and I think of, there's so many scriptures, but Ephesians 1, 22 comes to mind and it says, and he put all things under his feet. He as in God put all things under Jesus's feet and gave Jesus as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who dwell, who the fullness of him who fills all in all. And just this conviction and this reality that like we are his church and when he comes back <laughs> one day, like for his bride, he's coming back for his, his body. And like, in the same way he calls like husbands to love their wife as their own body. Like Jesus, Jesus, his bride, his body is us. And he's not coming back for a building. He's not coming back for a program. Like he is coming for you and for me. And, and so I just, it's, it's, we aren't, we don't go to church. We are the church and we, you know, we can't turn it off or turn it on. And that doesn't mean that going to a building is, is like this sinful thing, but that, that teaching and that heart understanding that like, I am the church, like we are the church was this huge, huge shift for me. And I knew that in my mind before, but like, I wasn't really living that. And and so I just felt compelled to share those big, two big shifts in my heart that took place that were really, really pretty costly at the time and like actually somewhat grieving because there was, there was other perceptions that I had had, whether growing up or expectations over my life that didn't fit that. Um, but the the fruit and the like rest in in actually like knowing his will and the truth of 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 just God's heart about those two things which I think are are probably two of the biggest I don't know two of the biggest things about my life is just like making disciples and being the church is is ev like it's it's my every day so um I just wanted to wanted to share those with you all so now you see why I married her. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, if you want to take it away, if you want. Yeah, Mark, was there anything like from this, any more specific questions that, that you'd like to ask, Mark? Thank you so much, guys. Um, I think that is a fantastic launch point into any other questions that we might have um, from anybody on the call. But um, yeah, just you guys' story and um, the way that you are just committed to just the simplicity of doing the, the main thing over and over again mm -hmm. uh, is really beautiful and inspiring and I think convicting. But um, I do have a couple things that I thought to ask, but before I do, uh, Randy, I see you're on, Daniel, Marcus, any of you guys, do you have anything you want to ask them for clarification or just questions for them? Well, then I'll jump in with a question. I know Marcus has got questions. He's always a good question asker. But uh, uh, one question I had, I, I love the way that you put that, Neil. And I, I, I noticed um, that point in the story when you talked about we were a mile wide and an inch deep. Mm -hmm. And then you went all in and that's when you started to see multiplication. Could you lean into that moment a little more? Talk about why that was important and what happened to get you to that next paradigm shift. Yeah. Um, for us, when, when I started doing this, we honestly thought that house churches was the answer. You know what I mean? So like, we're thinking if we go start a bunch of house churches, we'll, we'll reach everything, you know, and Jeremy basically said the same thing just a little bit ago, but we had to learn over time that 
um, the, the command from Jesus is to go make disciples. Mm-hmm. Um, so now, like, the if, if you would have talked to us early on, we would have told you house churches is the most important. That would have been what our main identifying thing. Now people will call us up and they'll be like, hey, we hear that you guys do this house church stuff. Can we come be a part of the house church stuff? You know? And I'll say, hey, first off, like, you think of us as the house church people. That's not really how we think of ourselves. And I say the first, the thing that's of first importance to us is that we would know God and that God would know us. That is something we can never lose. And that is just like, we need to have the gospel at the core of who we are, what we believe and so that. But then from there, the thing that's more important than that is that we would be disciples that make disciples. And so then I'll actually say to the people who call up, because they're like, hey, could you get us plugged in with a house church? I'll, I'll just be like, you think of us as a house church people, but the truth is, is if your heart is not to be disciples yourselves, to grow more into the image of God, that actually go and make disciples, there are 200 other churches around here. I will help you find one of those. And so just, and I'm not trying to be mean or rude when I say, I'm saying it like really to the point right now, I'm hopefully a little softer when I talk to other people about that, but we're just really trying to show we have to go make those disciples. And then like what Ryan alluded to, what Jeremy said is when you so generously over time, if you don't slow down with the few, you won't see that that generational growth. So like what Jeremy was talking about is right on because we, we thought the, the litmus for success was how many house churches do we have? In, in all honesty, we could go start a ton of three thirds group house churches, whatever you want to call them. We could go start a ton of those and not move the, the needle on the kingdom an inch. Okay. But when instead we actually, from sowing generously, you find those few when you slow down with them. It's exactly what Jeremy said that then you've made a disciple who is, who is learning or has learned to labor in season and out of season. And that's an important thing because it's easy to be a disciple when it's easy. It's hard to be a disciple when it's hard, but we have to learn to be a disciple in season and out of season. And so by the grace of God, you get to find those people, you get to walk with them. And then like what Ryan and Jeremy were saying is then they will go start a group and that group will implode. Stuff will get messy. It'll get awful. I mean, Ryan, how many times does that happen to Justin? <laughs> you know, like, uh, yeah. And, but when you have that person whose heart becomes resolved, not because of a program, not because of tactics, but their heart is resolved because of the glory of God and because of the scriptures, now you can't stop them. And so we're not, we're not trying to sell people on a model or a method or tactics or tools or principles. We're trying to get people into the presence of the living God. Mm. And from there, then we're trying to coach them to be those disciples who learn how to utilize tools well in such like that. But you got to find those few. And when you do, it's like gold. It is like um, there's in, um, uh, I think it's first Corinthians. I can't remember. It might be first Corinthians three. It talks about six different materials that there are to build. It says some will build with hay, wood, or straw. And some will build with um, gold, silver, and precious stones. But then it says all things will be tested uh, as with fire. And here's the interesting thing is if you think about that, um, which of those six materials, and this is a quiz now, which of those six materials are most flammable? of hay, wood, straw, gold, silver, and precious stones? This isn't a trick question. Precious stones. (laughs) No, you're lying. (laughs) You're wrong. (laughs) So obviously in the scripture, the things most about hay, wood, and straw. What things are most easy to gather of all those materials? Hay, wood, and straw. So we are on the hunt for that, that precious, the, the gold, the silver, the precious stones. And when you find it, to treat it as such, to slow down, to see those things cultivated well. And then 
by the grace of God, then you're not twisting arms. You're not trying to convince people, go multiply, go multiply. Instead, it becomes much more of the nature of the person by the spirit of God. So that's just a Ashlyn, Ryan, Jeremy, any, anything to add to that? Um, one, one other point where Ashlyn already got to, to, to share this, um, but the, the thing that comes to mind from you in this too is, especially if you're working with um, church background people, is to make sure when you're talking to them about being a disciple who makes disciples that you actually slow down with them and have them count the cost of following Jesus. Um, and so that's like Luke 14 sorts of stuff. I, I think a lot of the, the vision stuff that we set, it's really good to share vision, but it's really easy to share a very, um, um, like a, almost like a get rich quick scheme vision. Um, and that's not what we do. Jesus tells us we're, we're not signing up for the get rich quick scheme of disciple making. He tells us we're signing up for the narrow road. He tells us we're signing up for picking up our cross daily and following him. He tells us we're signing up for giving up everything we have. We're signing up for a life at the altar. We're signing up for being that kernel of wheat that falls into the ground and dies. We're signing up for being those who endure many persecutions, trials, hardships, and sufferings. We're signing up for those who are pruned so as to bear more fruit. Um, don't get me wrong. We're signing up for all the blessings. We're signing up for the glory of God. We're signing up for, for, um, for eternity beginning now with him. We're signing up for all those things. But I think sometimes in the process of trying to get people to sign up for being disciples that make disciples, we don't tell them on the front end enough about the hardships to come. And so like even these guys now, when they baptize people, I, I, um, taking a, a lesson from their playbook is they have the people literally say in the, in the midst of baptism that, you know, even with persecutions that would come, I would not deny Jesus. Even with hardships, I would not stop following him. Um, so that is something that I think early on when I was sharing vision, I actually shared it probably way too much as get rich quick stuff. And then, but it just, it, it breeds, um, weak, weak disciples. Um, so instead we started moving that conversation of counting the cost into the front end of our disciple making. So we'll have that conversation. Now, if, if somebody is coming to the Lord, we will have that conversation before baptism. If it's somebody who's already professed faith, we will have that conversation now before somebody commits to walk in being a disciple who makes disciples. Amen. Marcus? I have questions. <laughs> um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, first, I was wondering, um, I mainly just have two questions, but the first one is just like, how do you deal with the, like the transient nature of like college campuses? Um, like, do you deal differently with that than like in maybe other settings of life? Cause like you've got students who may only be there for a year or two and they're gone. Um, as far as even just like groups and house churches and um, it's like by nature, not going to be a place where people will be more than just a, a handful of years. I was curious if there's anything you just treat differently because of that. Yeah, you guys, Ryan, Jeremy, Ashlyn, you guys jump on that one. We all have thoughts on that because, yes, that's very true, but go for it, guys. Yeah, I, I'll share a little, and then Ryan and Ashlyn can share it to you. It's a, it's a great question. Um, I think something that we've all felt and had to, had to walk through and are walking through at different times, and, um, and, and that's – that's where I think this point of discipleship becomes all the more important um, is what, what I've seen like fruitful from more like working and discipling people who are in a college scene is, is when there's a, 
an emphasis on disciple making. And, you know, I've, I have good friends who are doing, um, like a, a campus ministry in, in, in town here. And it, it kind of is a little bit sad to hear. They're just like struggling so hard, um, because they're at a, at a community college. So even more trans here is like most of them, you know, pretty much, I mean, everyone is commuting and then they're there for two years and then they're, they're gone. And so, and their, their ministry is built on, on Bible studies and getting them to continue to last. And, and it's just, it's so difficult. Um, and so again, the emphasis is like pouring deeply into those few, um, who once they graduate college, they'll still be making disciples and ministering wherever they go. Um, so that, that was a thought. And then, yeah, I can pass it on. I don't want to be too redundant here, but the, Paul says it's good that we remind each other of the things that we already know. So uh, it says go make disciples. Uh, it, says, it does not say go start groups. And I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and to give a real life example, I was discipling a guy named Justin um, and still am. He was in college when I started to pour into him and he the, the thing about college scenes is the transientness creates group commitment, very difficult because you're seeing rapid season change. And, and then you get out of college and they get a job, get married, have a kid. And all of a sudden your season change is like really long, very consistent seasons. Um, and so it's, it's like, um, it's like a good thing and a bad thing. And the good thing is college campuses are incredibly incredibly um perfect uh to be able to make a disciple who then has like a ton of free time to then like like generous generously so in a a pretty safe environment of like-minded similar age people with a lot of time and begin to implement a lot of these principles to then be launched all over the world to go and do this all over the nation And so it's like, and then you stay in touch with them. And so like that discipleship relationship with me and Justin, he graduated, I'm still in touch with him. And um, in each of those seasons, I've been there uh, to help assist him and helping form a group. And now like he's, he's seen it enough times that he he doesn't need my help to assist him in the new season to come to do that. And so um, that'd be my short brief thing. It's just, yeah. Yeah, I just, echo that we we feel your pain that it it is a difficult season to see devotedness um I want to encourage you that like one (laughs) it it's it's kind of a negative but the Lord can really use it as a positive is that there there are some high filters um in the college setting just natural filters within college where people are getting pulled so many different directions. There's so much offered to them all the time. Um, Like as a college student, it was like, I had a million and one groups I could choose to be a part of. And, And so in the offer of discipleship and of, of like making disciples, there, there is, the cost to be weighed and so just want to encourage you to find those who are willing to like let go of the three other bible studies and like running them through all the different groups to actually just make disciples and then I want to encourage you that I was a senior in high school when I was first not in high school in college <laughs> when I was first trained and I didn't see like a group formed or anything like that but in my senior year the lord was really growing me and like the karstens neil and his wife were a huge influence just by opening their home um having me over for dinner a handful of times opening their home for like 6 a.m prayer like three days a week they they were at in that season they were hosting that and other other things like that um and then ryan was like a good friend who 
wasn't maybe like formally discipling me or that wasn't like acknowledged but by all means friend really good teach- friend <laughs> <laughs> now we're married whoa um and so praise the lord but we yeah so like I wasn't I didn't see like a group formed in that time but like I was trained to to share and I began to do that and I was I was really began to catch this vision and so I went on from from school to then end up starting a group and now I'm still but I just echo that that like can't hold too tightly to seeing maybe like different a year from now we could like say something totally different because the Lord is really teaching us and I would say like we haven't there's no like silver bullet or like one way to go Mm. we live in a college town and we're still trying to figure out like what do we do with all those hope college students (laughs) over there and how to interact with them so um piggybacking on that I think it's important to remember that a group uh, grouping people together can serve two functions and both are useful. Um, they can serve the, the function, of course, people coming together, having that, that family together, being actual family together. But being a group together can actually help you to find the few. Some of the few that you find actually come from bringing a, a group together. So for us in that, sometimes when a group falls apart, it's not entirely a failure because you might have found one. Do you get what I mean? Like, as, as I say that you might've found somebody who's like, praise the Lord. This is a person that the spirit is really stirring inside of. And that can still be true at, um, at the college level. So I don't think it's, um, it's not like we would ever say, Hey, don't do group stuff in college, but don't put your emphasis upon that because the discipling is where you're going to see the lasting fruit come from. And so, um, and of course this is different. We're speaking of people who would already be professing Christ. You know, if you're working with people in the harvest within the the college setting, that's a different, that's going to be a different matters of patience and such along those lines. Oh, that's really good. I love it. Um, if I may, I ask one more question, unless someone else hey, wants to. Hey, one, one other point to that, though, is as well, Marcus, is um, at some point with some of the people you're, you're walking with, if you feel like there are few who are on your heart to actually slow down with and start walking with, at some point, you got to have almost like a DTR with them. You got to define that relationship. So to take, like, let's say you're working with this group of college students, but it's all super amorphous and whatever for you to actually kind of narrow it down a little bit and then go and talk to them and say, Hey, it's, it's really on my heart, actually, that, that we would sincerely walk together, that we would learn how to be disciples, be formed ourselves more and more into the image of Christ but also that we would be highly intentional to go make disciples and to actually have almost that sit down intentionality conversation with that person um, can be such a helpful thing in that conversation. If that person says, I would love to do that. That is the point at which I would say to them, like, I want you to know that in doing this though, we are signing up for the same sufferings that Christ signed up for. So that's what I'm talking about of, of, again, putting that count the cost conversation at the beginning. So they know that. Um, so then you're not hoodwinking them down the road when all of a sudden it gets really hard. You're telling them up front the road of following Christ. It is, it is a praise, a joy and honor by the spirit. Um, but we still got to go and kill the flesh. So. That's good. Wow. Thank you. Um, Nice. Uh, so my other question was just, um, so you mentioned even like, like uh, which I love the phrase, like we talk about sowing so, slim. So I'll just give you a point, tips or advice on how you found it been good for, for sowing generously um, on a college campus and for 
like how you invite in on a college campus. So like, um, you know, inviting into that discipleship where you're just sowing generously on a college campus since it's, you know, it's just kind of its own animal in general um, compared to like maybe other sectors of the world and culture. Yeah. Ryan, you just got to share your, your revelation from the pulp. I, I, <laughs> I, I guess I can, um, but I, yeah, I, um, I went like door to door on every single door in uh, all the dorms to recruit people for this three week long tug of war. Okay. And I was like, this is going to change your life. <laughs> this makes no sense to you guys, but Hope College has this huge, like, it's like a hundred year long tradition, this massive tug of war competition but it is intense so anyways so like i was just convicted one day i was like man i was able to do that for something that is completely worthless of your time um and now i have like the the boldness of the holy spirit and yet i have a message of hope for eternity and now i'm like scared in my boots to go and talk to people um and so i don't even wear boots but I don't know who said that. Um, and so bullet points to your, uh, we'll keep it brief. Uh, we can often repeat because we, we love this so much. But um, bullet points is I would like sow yourself, um, keep going day by day by day by day, and then find somebody and then invite them in and make that mission, the threshold, make the mission, the entry door and then be like hey i'm gonna be sewing come with me uh mm -hmm. i'll make you become a fisher of men and then you keep sewing and sewing and sewing and sewing and then they're with you watching you sew and then they'll be like well you know i have this buddy that like i want to like bring him along and be like sweet let's go do that so uh then we just keep sewing um i know this sounds like simple um but it, it just is, um, it, it happened. We did it, we, we did it today. Um, um, we, I had been pouring in Justin, Justin then um, has a, a friend who's a sophomore in college, his name's Case. And then Case brought his other friend who then, um, Josh, who then we all went evangelizing this afternoon. And it, it just be, it like naturally does that. And then as you become um, once you find that one person who you want to, that wants to go with you, um, then you, you always just sew with him. Don't like keep sewing, uh, over here, just sew with him. Um, and then when he can sew and then whenever anything gets stirred up, then, uh, let him disciple the, the person that gets sewed, sewed up. So, but it's helpful. I like it. Hey, Bree, how you doing? Hey, good. This is my wife, Brianne. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Jeremy, Jeremy, anything to, or Ashlyn, anything else on, on that point? Uh, no, that's good. Yeah. I think just a just to speak something really similar in a brief way is I think a lot of times we're looking for the shortcut to multiplication. Um, and I think sometimes we, we realize uh, we gotta, we gotta just find that person a piece like at the, at the college and then actually either walk with that person or whoever they connect us with and then truly trust that disciples will make disciples. And I think, um, Sometimes to find those few, you've got to sow broadly. We don't do a lot of like mass gathering events, you know, so we don't, we don't do like, Hey, we're going to have some really as big of a worship session as we, as we can or something like that. I'm not opposed to those if they intentionally boil down to find the few who you, who then you actually walk with. Um, but a lot, we, we just pray a lot to find those few and then um, go around and share generously. Yeah, on a, on a practical sense, I think I made this assumption. I just don't want to make this assumption is that tangibly, when I say so, 
it is us going and sharing our story, transitioning into the gospel and, and calling uh, those people to repent. Um, and uh, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And if they reject you, shake your sandals off and say, hey, bring the seriousness back to them. Be like, hey, like we have brought the kingdom and you are rejecting it. And I just want to like, incre like increase the severity. Like right now you're rejecting God and he's going to come and it's going to be greater for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you on that day. And, and that's just Luke 10. So I did, tangibly, I just wanted to not make that assumption. Oh, that's a, that's a good point at the end. I like that. <laughs> Heavy. Oop, there goes. That's on. What other uh, questions do you guys have or anything coming up with this year? Daniel or Randy? I am just listening. <laughs> no, no questions. That was really good. Um, Kika told me a few years back in dealing with students to help me to reshape my focus, Marcus, was that in dealing with students, you cannot have a church planting movement. You have a disciple making movement. And that's just what they had shared with us already. And uh, at the heart of any church planting movement is a disciple making movement anyhow. So uh, in dealing with students, the transient nature in and of itself says they're going to be going. So we're not trying to build that, that long-term commitment to each other, but trying to build a long-term commitment to making disciples. And so if, if that makes sense, that's, uh, that, that, that really helped me be free in the fact that I was just churning them out one after another, they were going away and we, we never had anything solid as far as the group. Um, but, but still we're, we're teaching people to share the gospel and make a disciple and send them out. So I appreciated what they, what they shared with us and love that last bit too, about the seriousness of uh, the kingdom of God has come near to you today. But I would use that. Mm. Thanks, Randy. Always love your thoughts. I love what they said. That was that's huge, man. Yeah. That's where even even like when when we're drawing some of this out, um, like drawing like trying to show people multiplication of okay, here's a group and you draw a circle and then you draw the line that goes over and connects another another group. I'm always like, the circles are not the important pieces. It's the line. That's the important piece because that is the connection from one disciple to another disciple that help bring those things together. We tend to think the circles are the really important pieces where it's actually the lines because the lines are where you're going to see not only disciples actually stay connected, but you're going to see way more health within those groups as well as in those disciples. Um, Well, I'd love to make space for you guys to share anything else on your heart. I think the the one thing that I wanted to um, get from each of you, I'd love it from all, all of you, which might take a little bit, but um, one thing that you would encourage yourself uh, three, four, or five years ago, whenever that was that you really first got started, and then one thing that you would exhort, you would say, hey, do this. Don't back off of this. So one thing you'd encourage and one thing you'd exhort. I'll jump in more. Uh, I think it's Acts chapter five. The thing I would encourage is after the church has had the 3,000 added in a day and the 2,000 added in a day, 
uh, Peter and John have healed the man who's looking for silver and gold. They've been beaten at the end of that chapter. I think it's verse 42. It says that they did not cease sharing Jesus. Uh, this is a very loose translation in, in the homes and in the temple daily. And um, the Holy Spirit really convicted me that there'll never be a great movement of God without a continual sharing of Jesus. So never give up on sharing the gospel. That's, that's what we got to do. And uh, I think I, I've learned that you just, what, what they've already shared, they're further down the road than me, but just keep trying to make a disciple. Who will make a disciple? And um, yeah, I fail all the time. You just keep on failing forward, right? That's what uh, my friends Mark and Brian and other people teach me. So we, we keep trying to do that. Those, those are two things I've taken from it. That's good. So Ryan, Ashlyn, Jeremy, Haley, is that what it was? Haley and Neil? Bree. Bree and Neil. Love to hear from you guys uh, as well. What is one thing that you would encourage yourself? Um, each of you were talking about early on in your journey and one thing you would exhort. Yeah, uh, I'm unmuted, so I'll go. Um, the exhort, I'll start with the exhort. Um, I can't begin to explain the importance of mole and KOS, um, which is, I don't know if you, if you use that terminology, is discipleship defined, knowledge, obedience, sharing. Um, those things are incredibly critical. Uh, and as well as knowing, not making the assumption uh, of preaching obedience before grace. Uh, and so like, if there was ever a charge or a, a admonishment is like, make sure and never make the assumption that they understand deep in there about the finished work and building from grace to glory and um, the importance of KOS and mall. Uh, you just hold fast to those principles uh, and you just do the Bible. It, it'll be, it'll be a joyous time. And so I guess that's my encouragement as well is, is, um, is to like not grow weary when it gets really hard and you're the only one and you've all saw your friends and you are alone <laughs> and people are slandering you, calling you a cult. And, uh, people, I mean, the list goes on about the sufferings. Um, in the friendship loss in the betrayals in the Judases. And I just like encourage you, uh, that upholding truth is of the utmost importance and it's worth it. And I will, I will die on that, uh, that it of me upholding truth. Uh, I've lost a lot, but I've gained so much more. So that's my encouragement and admonishment. Um, so my encouragement is the first thing that came to mind is um, just that there is there is always a disciple being made. It just might be you. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So <laughs> you you take a disciple out evangelizing and you all sow and so and it seems like all these things are stirred up and then nothing like there is still a disciple being made and it's it's that person you took evangelizing as well as yourself and you might pour into someone for months and then it just completely flatlines and and all of that you're like well i didn't make a disciple and it's like wrong there is always a disciple <laughs> being made it just might be you Amen. And so um i just want to encourage you all in that and and then um my exhortion 
Oh no, I just had it. Um, I just kind of, it's, it's two, they, they, I, but they're both short. One is that um, it's probably going to be slower <laughs> than you think it's going to be. Uh, and, and your disciples like are probably going to need more of your time, more of your like repetitive, just coaching and teaching and going with them then maybe you think um, Paul refers to Timothy as, as his child in the faith and child rearing is, is not like a quick or an easy process. Um, so just like, yeah, the importance of like shepherding and patience in that. And then my other exhortion is, is to pray that the, um, I think, the work that we really saw begin in Grand Rapids started with prayer, um, like 6 a.m. prayer every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And all of it. <laughs> lots of, lots of like just prayer, just on our knees alone with the Lord. And um, I encourage, if you don't have disciples, like just pray for them, like ask the Lord um, because it is not by might, it is not by just like even sowing enough, it's going to be by his spirit that like he brings us to the people he desires us to and, and just encourage you to pray a lot. And one last thing, cause she reminded me of it is Hebrews six milk to meat. teach your disciples. The milk is very important and feed them like a child. Uh, and like, don't do this weekly thing. If they are free tomorrow, meet with them tomorrow. If they're free the next day, meet with them the next day. If they're free the next day, meet with them the next day. They are children. They need milk. Teach them milk and, and let them tra transition to meat and, and solid food. Um, mine would be, uh, I think, a big thing that I've learned um, to where I have a lot of peace now um, is I think early on it, you have kind of like, like eyes for the things that shine um, when you're you're meeting people and trying to find people to pour into and um, is I have I feel like this whole list of like people that um, sort of came into my life and just kind of drifted out and and for multitude reasons and like so many people where I thought like this is the guy like this is the guy like that's going to change the whole world um and you like bank it on you know they like just are all about like the vision all in and they they seem like it but then you know something pans out where they have all these events going on and then you just like can't get a hold of them and I just have learned to stop chasing those types of people and um not that they're like uh bad people or unfruitful people but i'm so much more content to meet with the ordinary unassuming people that i think maybe a majority of uh you know big time leaders would probably maybe overlook you know the davids who um yeah who are just kind of unassuming and like but if they're going to be faithful and they're going to obey God and, and the simplicity, I'll give them, you know, my time, I'll give them my life. And I'd much rather have somebody who's even keeled and will be faithful and steadfast and consistent um, than something that will sprout up like crazy. Um, but then the next day, you don't know where it went. Um, so that, that was something I've learned over the years that I'd really encourage my, myself and other people in. Do you have anything? Yeah. Um, a couple things came to mind. Um, one, I think at the beginning, um, when I first started gathering simply and um, started to be discipled, all all I knew was that like what had significantly changed in my walk with the Lord was that I was in a house church. So for a while, um, that was like what I was proclaiming was like house church. Like, it's all about house church. House church changed my, changed my life. Like, this is it. And um, it, 
it was like a handful of months of that <laughs> where I realized that like everybody didn't want to hear about house church anymore. And um, I think it just like, yeah, caused some confusion. And, um, and then God like really unveiled to me that it wasn't house church, like it's Jesus and it, it was the accountability um, and gathering and, and really holding one another to the word um, that changed my life. Um, and, it, you know, it was loving God that really changed my life. And um, so, yeah, just like being reminded, like, it, it's not house church. Like, that's not what we're trying to, like, sell people or something like that. Um, and then the other thing is, like, kind of similar to Jeremy's, but there was a few people at the beginning I tried to walk in discipleship with and um, just, like, yeah, I think because I was so passionate about it, I maybe like just projected that on them, but they like weren't about it as much as I was and, and didn't, you know, they weren't super faithful or weren't really available or weren't super teachable. Um, and I tried for a really long time to like still walk with them and like teach them and um, hold them accountable. And it, it ended up, one of them was my sister and it just led to like a lot of like yeah I don't know like arguments and division and um I realized that I was like pulling her um that she wasn't actually like a faithful disciple who like wanted to like grow and and be taught and so I think knowing now like to have the discernment of like does this person like like do they really want to learn do they really want to follow me as I follow Christ um and I think like what Neil said is really good of like having that hard conversation right off the bat of um, like, yeah, just like the cost of it all is super important. And um, yeah, I think that would have saved me probably a lot of grief at the forefront. And yeah. That's Those are really good. Um, yeah, for myself, I wish um, there's a, there's a lot of things I wish I could go and share with myself. Um, I, I think the thing that comes to mind for me just right now and thinking about it is we can go do a lot of stuff and not love. Um, we can go do a lot of stuff and not love God. And we can go do a lot of stuff and not love the people around us. And I could, I could almost start crying right now if, if thinking about um um, the ways that I uh, walked and even walked with people and uh, honestly probably didn't even love them all that much. Um, and so I th I'm, I, I believe I'm better at that now than I used to be. And I praise the Lord for that. Um, and the, the thing, uh, again, I said it a, a couple of times, Bree just brought it up as, as well. Um, I don't share this because it's the most important thing. I think other things are actually more important, but I think they get other things get talked about more. So I, I would just encourage you guys in this. Like, like I think the, the glory of God in the gospel is like, if it fix our eyes on that, oh my goodness. Um, but in terms of practical, like a practice piece to, to maybe implement is for one, for each, each of you and each of us, to really search ourselves in the sense of um, have we counted the cost of following Jesus? And if we have, if you have not take some time to do it, um, the people you're walking with, have you sat down with them and had them count the cost of following Jesus? Um, and so I don't, I don't say that because I believe it's the most important thing. I just say it because I, I think it's a thing in a, a lot of our discipling that gets just bypassed. Um, so that would be my encouragement with that. I just want to speak uh, encouragement for you, Neil. Uh, you have grown in that, and it's been awesome. And I love you. And it's been awesome to see the ways that you love people. <laughs> Thank you, brother. You guys have taught me that you, okay, some, this is just a testimony to these guys, to Jeremy, to Ryan, to their wives these these guys have taught me and teach me regularly now more than they know like more than they know um 
I am humbled by them continually and I praise the Lord for them. So, uh, yes, like, and I'm see, I'm not saying that just to be nice. Like that's a real, that's so true. So, yeah. Um, I would, it's weird not being able to see myself. I'm seeing my own camera. Um, if you guys still have time, I would love to hear just like one, are you guys, I know you guys do, have done house church or are doing house church together. Um, you're, you're committed to each other. Um, do you guys go out together into the same harvest fields? Are you kind of like in different groups of people? Um, and how important do you think it is to have that, um, like team attack on, you know, <laughs> not attack, but you know, uh, like sending in a team versus, okay, I, I'm ministering to college students. You're, you know, with elementary school students, we're all over the place. I would like to hear how, um, folk, I guess a, a focus has there been focus where multiple families or people have been focused on one group of people and how has that contributed to the movement you've seen? I should let Ryan speak because these are the guys who taught me about the mob attack. So, uh... <laughs> yeah, it's an awesome question. It's an incredibly good question. Um, the mobbing came late to the game. Uh, and I will it never go really back. Terrible. <laughs> I, I mean, it sounds terrible. I will never go back. There's a, there's a reason. Think about Jesus walking into a town with 12 people and then inviting himself over to dinner to their house. Okay. Like it is, it's quite the show, like to like 13 plus people like showing up to the city and then they're like, like big disrupting of all of it. Um, the accountability of having other brothers and sisters with you uh, brings a, a force, um, that we, we say it's not a, it's not a me, uh, it's a we thing. And the more we understand that, the better. Um, and because we look so much more like Christ together than we are alone. Mm -hmm. And, and so to answer your question directly, it's a both hand. Mm -hmm. Uh, we all have, we all go. So in our own little fields, um, but then we're really intentional to go sew together. Mm -hmm. And, and it's just Acts 2, uh, 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers. And all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in your homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the number day by day, those who were being saved. And the beautiful thing in that, and like the quicker you guys understand this, the better is that um, the concept that we're, we're trying to embody is uh, there's like what, 7.8 billion people in the world, some, somewhere around there. Um, the, the world itself was populated by nuclear families. All we're trying to do is repopulate the world with spiritual families. And so like the amount of time that you spend with your nuclear family, that is the time that we should spend with the spiritual family and then just have kids and then just have more kids and have kids and teach your kids how to have kids. And it's like, you're just having, these nuclear families repopulate the world through exponential growth and do it together. Cause you know, you grew up doing everything with your family and we're just saying, do it with your spiritual family because it says that Jesus was like, Hey, your mother and brother are here. Uh, and well, they said that to Jesus and Jesus was like my mother and brother, uh, my family are the, my mother and brother are those who do the will of God. And so I would just encourage you all that, like those who you fellowship with, uh, your family are those who do the will of God and spend all your time with them. And then uh, on mission together. Uh, so that's how I'd answer it. Can I add a practical? Um, 
Yeah, so like Ryan mentioned the mob mentality and that doesn't necessarily mean we like knock on people's door with like 10 people or eight <laughs> people, but but like for example, yesterday, um, Ryan and I took a disciple of mine and her mom and then a disciple of his, which they're both our disciples, but a guy and a girl that we're both discipling and um, they each invited a person. And so the six of us came together we prayed on a street corner and we split up <laughs> and we walked around that little neighborhood and, and we, um, we evangelized. And then in our day by day, like we still share as the spirit leads primarily probably in that way. And then when it comes to our spiritual family, which like we gather with Bree and Jeremy and a handful of others um, and they truly are family and there's a lot of overlap of fields and as we're going into one another's fields we've just seen the fruit of co-laboring and so tomorrow I'm getting on a call with another sister that we gather with um, who's discipling a woman and I'm just joining her and and gonna co-labor to teach her this disciple some things but we really try to do as much as we can um like invite one another into it and go with one another because of just the fruit that we've seen in the example we see of Jesus doing that with his disciples. It's a great question. Yeah, I'd just say at minimum of like two by two because um, um, either you can be modeling for somebody or you can just join up with a dear brother or sister be like, hey, let's go together. We, and then we typically have name cards and then we like dress in similar matching apparel and the leader has like a flag and so. <laughs> we, we wear uh, backpacks and put on tags that <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that's something uh we have a lot of different people we're connected with that are sewing in lots of different fields and trying to figure out like what's that sweet spot with um you know to see movement happen and so it's helpful to hear mm-hmm. that you guys have experienced yeah it sounds it sounds slower but it that's like a, a normal that you need to adopt that it, it feels slow, but it's exponentially fast. Yeah. Um, so. Sorry, I just thought of another, like just tangible example that might might help. Like Bree and Jeremy have been modeling and assisting for a new group forming. And one night we, our whole group that we gather with just went and had dinner with that group and went evangelizing with them. And that's not like a regular commitment of the rest of us following up with that group and modeling for them. But we just went and like labored with Bree and Jeremy and got to like share testimony. And I mean, similar to what we're doing right now, like just being together sharing is just like, we represent Christ so much better together than like as individual members of the body thank you for sharing that part part of that too is um dna is sometimes better seen than it is explained Mm -hmm. and so when they get to see the dna of how you love one another and how you operate and stuff like that like it's that is contagious um Any uh, final questions for these guys? They're an hour ahead, I think, so we should uh, let them go and finish up their day. So you guys are so so energetic. I'm so impressed. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is the fun. Like this is this is fun. Like we we're doing the same stuff that you guys are doing. Like you guys are doing in this is happening throughout the United States like more than it used to be and so like like for 
us, I, I, I speak for myself, just being like, it's an honor to get to come and spur one another on and love and good deeds, you know? Um, and I'm sure we could, we could have another call where honestly, we could be like, okay, what are you guys learning? I feel like we got to like, come on here and be like, oh, here are some things we've learned and all. And I'm, I'm serious when I say like, I'm sure that we could sit down and be like, okay, hey, what have you guys noticed? What have you learned? And so thanks for giving us the chance just to share with you guys. Sincerely, it's an honor. Yeah. Yeah. been awesome thank you so much uh also uh daniel uh who was on he had to jump off he texted me but he said just make sure to say thank you um mm. he, he was somewhere else where he couldn't have his video on stuff but like he was listening um he also went to kuiper college i don't know if you guys know kuiper so um up there in gr but uh yeah so he went there he graduated i think like 2017 okay. yeah but it's funny i was we were, we were driving by kuiper while we were on this call with you guys oh no way <laughs> yeah he lives in texas now but yeah cool um also I'll, i go up to michigan uh to the Milan area almost every year at christmas time i don't know if and you go you guys are all up in the grand rapids area right or uh, holland area yeah okay cool you're welcome hey, Any, anytime uh, anytime I'll, yep i will say that you'll probably spend time with neil because jeremy and brie and ashlyn and us are all having babies in december so it is <laughs> yes <laughs> but my home is open my house <laughs> you have you have a hundred homes here he would welcome you, Marcus. Cool. <laughs> yes but thank you guys this was awesome seriously it was really cool thank you well, hey, would one of you guys, uh, or uh, maybe not all of you, because that would take a long time, but one of you guys uh, pray us out and just um, even just pray blessing over us um, as we go. Ashlyn, would you would you pray, sister? Yeah. Mm, Jesus, I I just praise you that that you have just like by your blood and by your spirit you just made us one that there's so much unity to be had um just before you and and as your body and i just praise you for just the church of oklahoma city that is represented on this call and lord i'm so encouraged to see these brothers and sisters and um I know that, that you had 12, Jesus, and you changed the entire world, and we're still talking about it today, and so the power is just not in numbers, it is in your spirit, and I just pray that these brothers and sisters would be filled with your spirit tonight. Um, I pray that all of us would just be built up in love tonight, that we would go on to just walk, walk in the, the good works that you've prepared ahead of time, and Lord, that you would continue to just teach us, that you continue to give us soft hearts and humble hearts that we might um, learn from you and take your yoke upon Amen. us that is, is easy and light. And Lord, I, I just pray that you would bless them and that you would bless their, their labor, not because of anything that they've done, but just that you would, you would have mercy on, on people that, that, people would actually come to know you um, through the testimonies of these brothers and sisters and, and that you would use them as, as your vessels, Lord, that they would be your ambassadors. And Lord, would you just strengthen them and, and just remind them of just how, how useful you see them as um, because of, of Jesus and because of the new life you've given. And Lord, just whatever your will is in the way of just continuing to collaborate and encourage, I just pray that you, you would speak that and that we would continue to be um, encouragement to each other um, until your return. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We love you guys. We look yeah. forward to seeing you all uh, at the round table when he returns. Amen. Thank you guys for your time tonight. Yeah. So good to, to see all of you and to spend some time together.